Hello, everybody, and welcome to this edition of the Digital Empathy Lounge brought to you by Anthrolytics. Now, if you haven't come across the Digital Empathy Lounge before, this is a podcast series exploring the best and next practices in experience management, including customer experience, and especially what great experiences should look and feel like. Now, today I'm in conversation with Chelsea D'Souza Costello, who is the co-founder and chief excitement officer at Exco. Hello, Chelsea. Hi, Peter. Thanks so much for having me here today. Uh, like Peter said, I am the chief excitement officer here at Exco, and I co-founded this Caribbean-based customer experience agency with two partners, Samantha Conyers and Sasha Thompson. Um, how did I get into the wild world of CX? Well, it started off in consumer behavior. That is really where my background is. And this is how I got into the role of chief excitement officer. And you'll notice that we're not big on titles in X school, right? We are a very differently built organization in that sense. And when coming up with our titles, we wanted it to speak directly to what the customers wanted, not so much of what we wanted internally. And we thought excitement in my role as the lead in customer journey mapping really brought that back to the customer in that sense. So yeah, quirky, but definitely speaks to what I do. Thank you, Chelsea. And that's actually such an interesting point um, in that you want to reflect what the customer wants, not necessarily what you as an organization want. And isn't that the secret of great customer experience? Giving customers what they want to receive, not what we think that we would like to receive in their stead. So, um, now, Chelsea, you and I have had a couple of conversations in the past, and you've shared with me a, a few interesting stories. So let me ask you this then. Lots of organizations have attempted to map their customer journeys, but it hasn't always gone well. Why do you think that might be? Well, Peter, firstly, I'm going to stop you on the word customer journeys here, because I want to touch on the use and, and probably abuse of the word journey in itself. We get countless requests. I need to map my customer's journey. Um, what is my customer's journey? Have you seen this journey? Can you review this journey? And more often than not, we open the document, we, we get into the workshops and it's not a journey at all. It's very internal. We are doing a lot of process flows out there um, or we're doing touch point maps using a lot of UX flows as journeys and we're not really covering the entirety of the customer journey. So I want to start there in that this is really such a buzzword and it does feel a little difficult for us in the CX space. I know that we're challenged with so many buzzwords in the CX space and journey is one of them, right? So we have seen this word come up in commercial rooms, in marketing meetings very often, and even in technical discussions recently, journeys is, is the leader of the conversation. Journeys is driving these conversations, but it's not journeys at all. So I feel like that's the first reason why it's a challenge. It's, it's totally disconnected from what you know the output to be. What is it that you expect out of these journeys? So let's get aligned first. And the internal disconnect then, from that misalignment of your overall strategy. We have lots of companies who have beautiful journeys, but it's very siloed or very disconnected and they're owned very separately. So maybe one department is owning one area of the journey and doing that really well, but one area of the journey is really lacking in support and resourcing. So you find that they spend their days outing fires and not actually looking at it from a holistic end-to-end -end point of view. And Recently, this is a, a hot topic of discussion for us is the defensiveness and the, the lack of will to face the truth. So we know internally our challenges. It's sort of like I can insult my brother, but you can't. It's, it's that sort of attitude of you can't come after us as a customer, but we can. And hearing it from the customer's point of view does bring out a little bit of that defensive nature and an innate need to defend your product and the hard work you're putting into. So even just facing the truth is one real hurdle to get over and something that once you can get over, you're already on your way to success. Thank you, Chelsea. And I think it was Jim Collins said that the first step in re-engineering your organization is to face the awful truth, whatever that might be, and how right he was. And I think you raised an interesting point as well about what do we mean by journey map? For many organizations, it's their internal process flow. And it only is when it coincident coincidentally touches on customers that we call it a customer journey map. 
But most organizations are actually obsessing about their internal process and calling that a journey. There's another point as well that what you said reminded me of is that very rarely do customers act in such a linear fashion that they go from A to Z in one straight line. Yeah, most of us live a rather chaotic life where, you know, we get interrupted, we get sidetracked, we do other things as well. We live our lives around a sequence of events. And I think you know, a customer's journey where it touches us as an organization is actually only a small part of their experience and yeah. their life. So I think sometimes you know, it, it, there's an old English expression, it's the tail wagging the dog. <laughs> that what we do is what we obsess about. We don't think about what it is that the customer is trying to achieve, what they want to get as an outcome. Now, you mentioned Absolutely. something very interesting there. You talked about the, the internal disconnection that can sometimes happen. And I've seen this in so many organizations where you have different stakeholders with different points of view, different objectives, um, and all of them have something they want to bring to that customer journey. Um, yeah, is there an example that stands out for you where you've seen that in practice and, and what did you take away from that? Peter, it's, it's hard to even pinpoint on one example because the truth is we see this in every workshop. This is such a common challenge and we do get the question at the beginning of a customer journey mapping workshop even asking, what am I doing here? You know, so many times you'll have IT in the room, you'll have finance in the room, they'll say, guys, I just have to know why am I here? And I said, okay, do you touch the customer journey? Well, yes, I touch the customer journey, but I don't own it, CX owns it, right? So even that discussion of who owns it, um, but this one example we had with a client, it was so exciting to see it unfold live. You know, it was like really bringing theory to life where we had a scenario where a customer is calling an IVR. The customer is saying that they did not receive the correct information in the SMS after pressing two on the IVR. So we brought everyone into the room. We have IT in charge of the IVR here, and we have the customer care agent right there in the room. And the, the customer care agent and IT are going at each other, right? They're saying, yes, I'm telling you, this happens on my system. It's sent. I can see the customers received it. The agent is saying, I am telling you, I'm seeing the customer screenshot. It has not been done. So all of these healthy debates are happening live. And they're working on the same touch point, delivering the same experience to the customer. And at the end of it, they came up to, they got the resolution and they said, I'm sorry, what's your name? It's nice to meet you. And I thought, how incredible that you are both delivering on the same exact experience for your customer and you have never met and far less even aligned and agreed on the experience you want to deliver. So it really is sort of that reactive approach that we're trying to avoid where we have a customer having a challenge and then we come together. And that's why customer journey maps sort of mitigate that in, in a sense where we are designing and we're going to orchestrate the experience for our customers because we don't want our customers to walk a journey and then we figure it out from there. We want to design the journey our customers are meant to walk and using all areas of the business get aligned up front so that we can negate all of these internal discussions and debates and break down some of these silos that we are so used to working in. Wow, uh, yeah, what a great example. And I think, um, well, again, there's a couple of things I've heard from that and a couple of thoughts that that spurred on me. Like you, I've seen this internal silo mentality, different functions within their silos different stakeholders, you know, perhaps product managers, you know, all of whom want to stake their claim on the customer. And they have these competing um, views. There's also, I think, something about the way that businesses are led and managed in that, you know, too often businesses create these silos because it makes it easier for them to manage within a silo rather than the entirety. But that's not what the customer sees. What the customer sees is you as a brand. And when you fail, it, they don't care whether it was a uh, challenge within distribution or a challenge within product development, or you didn't get your supply on time, all they know is that you failed them. And so they hold the whole brand to account, and yet the brands often don't hold themselves to account in the same way. So I think that internal alignment is a super important point. It also begs the question, um, and I think this is something I've just picked up from the last two things you were saying about, nobody owns the customer in that way. Everybody has a role as a stakeholder 
in the customer's success and in the business's success. And stakeholders, I don't mean shareholders. I mean, people that have an interest in those outcomes. And sometimes those are unusual people and you have to uh, find some mechanism where you can agree how to deliver against a customer expectation. Let me just give you one example of that. Um, somebody did some research and they talked to customers and they came to the opinion, customers want 24 hour delivery like they can get from that big platform vendor we won't name. Um, so that customer experience person went to the business and said, we need to offer 24 hour delivery. And of course, the person who's in charge of logistics and distribution at this point throws their arm up and say, well, I'm going to be on the hook for that. I'm going to have to pay for it. I'm going to have a, an SLA for it. I want nothing to do with it. So that was the first reaction from the business. Well, it's going to cost a lot of money and, and the other stakeholder didn't want to get involved. But actually, it also showed something they weren't listening to the customer properly, because what the customer actually said was, I would rather have predictability and know exactly when I need to be in the house in order to receive that package. I would much rather do that on a three day delivery and you give me a one hour slot than say it will arrive sometime tomorrow between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. But I don't know when. So you know, sometimes I think it's often easy for businesses to also take that internalized view and project it onto customers and think we know what customers want without doing that um, proper research, which I know you are so passionate about and Excodo does so much work in these workshops on is really understanding what it is that customers want and what the journey should look like from their perspective. So then, Absolutely. Yeah. that actually, it, I have an example to share very similar experience we had with a client where we were getting requests from customers, right? Our customers wanted to improve the pickup experience on picking up an insurance policy. So they're saying, look, I really want to make it easier for myself. Um, I'm, I'm finding it's too much effort to get the insurance policies. It only happens once a year. So it really should be this wow experience, right? So internally, um, the client decided to offer delivery. And we thought, wow, what a great idea, right? Delivery, who doesn't want to get it delivered? Like you said, the big who we shall not name is, is leading the space there. But when, when the delivery program launched, customers weren't quick to take it on and we couldn't understand why. And when you actually broke down the persona and you got to know when we held focus groups and looked at all of our research, when you got to know these persona, you understood now they didn't want delivery at all. In fact, they loved going to the branch into the physical retail space, seeing their rep for the first time in the entire year, taking them a little cupcake, thanking them for all they've done. You know, they enjoyed that experience. So we've almost punished customers and taken away an experience that they love and give them something that we love because one, we know internally it'll be a lot easier and more cost effective for us to do it this way. Um, so that's our goal. But we have lost sight of the customer's goal entirely. So similar to what you were saying of what did they really want and what did we actually deliver? Yeah, and I think this has been particularly in the world of digital, something that we have lost in the desire to remove that um, effort to take out that friction is, is lost those points of traction, those points of interaction. And as you quite rightly point out, that's often your only chance to shine that, you know, because the a customer who serves themselves, obviously they're delivering their own CX. Now you design it, but it, you know, they're the one that delivers it. That's a great point. Now, over the last year, I'm not going to talk about COVID other than to say it caused a lot of disruption. And a lot of businesses have had to think carefully about what they're delivering and how they're delivering it. Where should an organization focus its customer journey mapping efforts right now? So where should they start? What, you know, what would be their recipe for success, if you like? Well, I think, you know, to get started is, first of all, Customers have changed, we know this, this is the obvious, and the expectations have changed, and it's all about meeting expectations, not just delivering all these wow, amazing experiences, especially as everyone is going on this whole digital front. It's not just about creating the most amazing digital experience. You have to fix the basics. And what we often say now is, it's more important to be consistent in your experience than to have a wow experience, have the most incredible experience because you don't want to be memorable for the wrong reasons and it can very easily happen. So get your basic hygiene down. It's not going to matter if I get all dressed up and I have no basic hygiene. So I think that's most important where customers are now. They want to know what to expect. Like you said, predictability is key. They can predict 
they can expect that it'll always be consistent. Um, one of my favorite restaurants, I often say is not because they are the best in the, their cuisine. It's not the most incredible meal I've ever eaten, but I know what to expect every time. There's no disappointment. There's nothing crazy, no frills, no bells, no whistles, but I know exactly what I can expect. And I think that's what keeps me going back time and time again. And, you know, when it comes to journey mapping and it comes to being in the CX space, just get started and don't be afraid to get help. You don't have to be an expert in everything. Just get the help that you need to map the journey. And sometimes a fresh pair of eyes is exactly the help you need to get out of this everyday thinking and, and see it from this bird's eye view. Yeah, thank you, Chelsea. Um, and you're right, that consistency thing is so important because you know, the occasional pleasant surprise, we think that's a good thing, but actually what that does is make you unpredictable. Um, it's one of the reasons why some airlines have stopped giving away free upgrades, because at the time you receive it, you know, if I was expecting to turn right on the plane and I end up turning left, I think that's wonderful. But the next time I turn up, there's part of me secretly hoping I'm going to get another upgrade. And of course, I don't. And now I'm disappointed. because, <laughs> uh, But yet my expectation before was I expected to turn right. And as long as I got on the plane, had an uneventful flight, arrived where I wanted to go on time, that's a perfectly good experience. So I, like you, tend to really focus on those predictable, consistent, they're going to get it right every time experiences rather than the ones that occasionally get it brilliantly right. But on other times, perhaps they're a little bit lackluster. The other I thing that, that you've mentioned, sorry, is um, uh, you, you mentioned expectation and expectation is born out of consistency. I trust that when I press the red button, you will always do this. And I can only do that if you always do this. So expectation is often how we measure customer experiences as consumers and customers, not some arbitrary zero to 11 scale that we haven't had any say in. There is no universal measure of goodness for a customer experience. And Peter, you just touched on a word very lightly, and I feel like it's not fair how quickly you went over it. You said, I trust. And that's where it all comes back to. It comes back to that empathy element for the customer, right? So I trust and consistency and expectation all comes out of the element of trust between you and your customer and the relationship that you've built. Thank you, Chelsea. And what a great point to wrap up. So um, thank you again. And that brings us to the end of this episode of the Digital Empathy Lounge. Um, I want to thank Chelsea for being such a great speaker. Thank you. I really enjoyed your points. I know we're going to talk about this again in the future. Um, and I hope that um, those watching will join us for other episodes. You can find out how in the link below. And also, if you would like to be a speaker on the Digital Empathy Lounge, I'd love to hear from you. And you can find out how to do that as well in the comments. But until then, at this point, I'd just like to say thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. And goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Thank you so much, Peter.